we're recording now. Okay. Pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general law chapter 30A, section 18, this meeting of the Board of Health is being conducted via remote participation. I will have a roll call to check and make sure everyone on the committee and the staff's video and audio is working. So, Steve. Here. Tim. Here. Maureen. Here. John. Here. Emma. Emma? Are you here? Yeah. <laughs> I <laughs> couldn't <laughs> unmute myself. <laughs> and Nancy, here. <laughs> So the meeting is call to order. And the first thing on our meeting is to review the draft minutes from 2011, I mean, February 11th, 2021. So I, um, I read them, I didn't see anything. Does anyone have any comments? changes. May have a motion to accept the minutes as presented. A move we accept the minutes as presented from February 11th, 2021. Second. I'll second it. Okay. All in favor? Steve. Aye. Tim. Aye. Maureen. Aye. John. Aye. Nancy. Aye. Okay, so next on the agenda is Tapestry Harm Reduction Program. And Liz, why not, is here. Hi, Liz. Hi, everybody. So at our last meeting, Liz presented material and asked us if we would like to have the van come as part of the needle exchange and more comprehensive health and harm reduction to um, people in Amherst. Sorry about that. And last week I talked to Liz and I went and got the um, law and uh, Liz and I put together the request, which I sent out to all of you for the van to be coming to Amherst. Did you get the request? and have time to read it. Finishing now. Yes. <laughs> um, people have questions, comments, concerns. Yeah. I have two pieces. I When I sent this out, I CC'd Emma and Jen Brown, and I don't know if you saw Jen Brown's reply today, that just in this past week, there were two needles found in the garage um, and there was something to do with it. And uh, on that same line last year, right before the pandemic, I was walking in town and there was snow and I saw a needle on the ground between the toy box and the new apartment complex. I didn't have gloves. I didn't have a sharp box. So I, and it was 415. So I, the board of health was, Cl closed. So I walked over to the police department and they said, oh, we don't deal with that. Go over to the fire department. So I went over to the fire department and I said what I was. And she said, well, we don't have people with sharp boxes to pick these things up. So it just got left on the sidewalk and it was close to the toy box. So that's dangerous. Um, so that's one point. And the second point both Belchertown and Montague have approved this. And I called and spoke with their chairs of their board of health. And all they did was vote on it during their meetings. And then they send a letter to the state and supposedly, and I have a copy of the letter, but Liz can provide us the letter. And that's all those other two did in their February meetings. And they're both moving forward with tapestry. So I thought I'd share that information that I got um, this in the past week with you. What's the argument for not having a public hearing, a public hearing about it? It would delay it. And with the law, there's no need for a public hearing. And uh, there, this is the first really push for the vans in the 
western part of the state. It's all been in the eastern part of the state. And I looked in, in, in the eastern part of the state, no one's had meetings. All they've done is the boards of health have voted on it. No community in Massachusetts has had a meeting about it. As far as you know. Not, from what I, I I looked at a couple, and as far as I can tell, I didn't go into every van. It, there's that map, and I went into all those different. I went into several towns, and from what I gather, and I don't know, Liz, if you have any more information, but towns just the board of health just mm -hmm. approved this, mm -hmm. and Montague, Montague, did it, yeah. Montague and Belchertown did it at their February meetings. That's correct. Yep. <laughs> I, I don't I don't have information about that, how it was approved where mobile um, outreach exists in Eastern Mass. I, yeah, I, I do want to say that I, I had the opportunity to reach out to chief, the police chief and the fire chief. Um, the fire chief and I have been playing phone tag because we're both really busy and engaged with our each of our departments. Um, so we haven't been able to directly communicate. Uh, but I know that I spoke with Chief Livingstone, and um, he is in, he supports uh, Amherst Board of Health with this program for harm reduction. Um, it, it, he says that they, they don't see a, a lot associated with this. Um, I just tried to educate that, you know, sometimes we don't see the true outcomes and, and you know, the the stuff that we see is just the tip of the iceberg, um, that this is a really beneficial program. It, it, it's the captive audience to get one step closer to possible treatment or engagement um, and trust. So, and like I think you've said, Nancy, it's one of those 2030 goals for yeah. public health, correct? Yes, it is. And then yeah, I, I, yeah, I personally support it, but I just think, you know, sometimes people have a, a question they want to raise and it's, better if you do it beforehand, but I, I can see if nobody else is doing it, it's fine. Let me just raise one thing that somebody would say that somebody might say, and you could tell me what the answer is. So, and I think it's the obvious one that someone will say, well, it definitely will uh, help the people who are current users, but by normalizing it, it will possibly put somebody who's a little bit on the fence or they, they have a, you know, some a sudden opportunity and it might make them go the wrong way if they know that they're not going to get HIV or hep C and uh, so it, it might encourage somebody to do it. And I've looked up the data on it and you, we could certainly say, you know, there is quote, no evidence of that. But what does that mean? You know, you're talking about absence of evidence, really not evidence of absence. And, you know, the studies, it doesn't seem like they necessarily had the statistical power to really detect a small number of people doing that. So uh, what do you say to somebody that says, it's fine, you're helping all those people, but my relative or my loved one might be tempted to use because of this. Yeah, well, so in addition to, I, I think the evidence, well, because so, some of the other evidence, you know, shows drastic decrease of HIV and hepatitis C. People that are, do engage with um, syringe access programs are more likely to enter treatment. It doesn't have effect on crime or, or, um, or it's, it's actually it helps with public safety officials with, with needle sticks and possible transmission. Um, I think it's also important to know that you can purchase uh, syringes at any pharmacy. And so downtown Amherst, um, wherever. And then also to make it clear, so, so Tapestry is funded by the state and to be able to use state dollars to provide the service, we need local board of health approval. But outside of that, it's um, any anybody, it is actually legal for anybody to distribute syringes now. So on a volunteer basis or, or anything like that. So, and then that, and then in addition, um, we are in the midst of a really terrible fentanyl infiltration of the heroin. The, the overdose rates are going up. Um, unfortunately, COVID has impacted the amount of people that have started using drugs again or started injecting and just the suicide rates and everything related to the, this hard year that, that um, we've experienced. So there's a lot of, so with that, the lack of evidence, I guess, versus the incredible amount of evidence of how helpful this is for people who need it and their families and the community and the benefits it has. Um, that's that's my summary, I guess. All right, that's, that's well said. Liz, you might be able to speak a little bit to this. I, I did a lot of public health work in Springfield mm -hmm. and in the North End and at 
treatment programs and sites for users. And the big argument for over 20 years in Springfield was just what you're bringing up, Steve, that if you have needle exchange here, you're gonna have more people using. Well, guess what they found out? After they had the needle exchange, they had less, less deaths, more Narcan, and more people going into treatment. And they saw it as a positive outcome. Um, I don't know if you can address that because I stepped yeah. back from my work in the north end of Springfield after I retired from Elms College. And, and I was with Tapestry before uh, needle exchange was approved in Springfield or Holyoke, which are the two hardest hit cities by far in Western Mass. And it, 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 it felt terrible to only be able to leave um, bleach kits, which is provided by the DPH and, and not be able to leave syringes. And then in addition to that, the, the amount of HIV from injection drug use has just been very high, um, amount of overdoses and decreasing. So, so so it did exist before it was approved. Um, some, and then, um, I mean, in, in Holyoke especially, it, it's been really, I think, wonderful to see the positive impact that it's had in the community. Because yeah, I, I grew up in Western Mass, and I'm you know just familiar with Holyoke in different ways. Um, and and as far as the community support in 2012, when Holyoke was approved, it, it was very controversial. Um, we did a after it was approved we did a lot of education to the community we started um neighborhood cleanups and did a lot of community involvement i mean top street is known i think for being involved with the community that 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 grew the support i my experience has always been with people who are hesitant like the education the experience is always gone and the way of understanding how important the service is i guess mm -hmm. And when I when there was when they were just doing bleach kits in Holyoke and Springfield, because that's where I did public health with students, you saw needles all over the place on the yeah. ground. And the <coughs> literature shows that, and that's dangerous. What if a kid picks it up? And you don't know if the, the person who's had it has had hep C or HIV and a kid gets a needle stick. Sure. As I said I saw this by the toy box. That's why I was so worried last year. Um, and there's been decreased uh, syringe litter in both of those um, cities after the syringe pro exchange program went through. People in Amherst have been able to exchange syringes since you opened 25 years ago doing it in Northampton. Yeah. We're just making it a little more convenient for some people without transportation and other issues. One other very important thing also to mention is that we do syringe disposals. So the pharmacies don't offer syringe disposal. And I'm not, I'm not sure what Amherst's current method of um, disposal is like, but that, that would be another service that we would integrate into this. And, and, we, and we would do disposal for people, di people um, with diabetes or you know, other things that they just need like a free and easy way to dispose. Yeah, currently we do um, have a needle disposal program. It's it's how, housed out of the transfer station since the start of the pandemic, um, but we do offer that. But I think this is a great addition to. But also you need a hundred dollar permit to get into the transfer station. I I, I I think they accept it without the permit. If you but have how many needle. people know that? All I know is I need a hundred dollar permit to drive my car in there. Yeah, I, I know that during some homebound visits, I've um, transported some sharps for people yeah. in closed containers because of that fact. That's a good point, Nancy. And also I'm responding in the 1990s, we knew three kids who died of overdoses in town. My daughter's um, classmate, December senior year, another friend of hers brother and another friend of hers whose mother is a, a realtor in town her brother so three kids three boys mid to late teens in amherst overdosed and if there was harm reduction and if they could have been led to some kind of program maybe they and it just f scares me if you look at any of the literature now it's the fentanyl that's going way up in numbers and that's what's causing deaths so if we can just save and if you see that we had three deaths here in amherst in in 19 and what were the number of uh, 30 EMS incidences, which 
says there's a problem. So other comments or questions for Liz, Tim or John, Maureen? I do, I was just curious about the needle exchange. I mean, how do, do you have to exchange them to get new ones or if you just need new ones, can you get new ones? Well, so, so we we do it on a, uh, based on what the person needs in that moment. Um, there, there's a lot of reasons why the like one for one exchange isn't isn't the best way to go. Um, mm -hmm. One in Western Mass. I mean, in addition to I think the things outlined, it might have been outlined in the in the document that um, Nancy and mm -hmm. I worked on, but. Uh, transportation is a really big barrier, mm -hmm. especially in rural parts of Massachusetts, including Amherst. Um, and we work with all sorts of people, some, a lot of people, and I'm thinking of people from the greater Amherst area, um, will come to us, but only bring syringes in after a few months. Um, mm -hmm there's still a fear of transporting syringes. And because, I mean, you technically can get arrested or it could be a probable cause for further search. And so there's all a, a myriad of reasons why it's important to be flexible. Yeah. Um, but our data- well, I was thinking that was a barrier to getting the yeah. safer syringes. Um, yeah, but, but that is also, I think a community concern. I mean, I've definitely been asked that question before. Our, our tapestry data does consistently show that we are bringing, actually bringing in more needles than we're giving out. Um, and we, you know, we, we do things, we're starting, and so we're actually starting, like one thing I'm, I'm interested in doing more in Amherst is um, going to people's homes or wherever they are and, and mm -hmm. providing it there. You know, we started to implement cell phones and text messaging and, and kind of like like even lower barrier ways of meeting people. Um, so that so that in itself I think will also help to increase the amount of needles coming in. Mm -hmm. I saw in, in Northampton there's a, a like a stainless steel disposal box near the near where that homeless encampment was. And I wondered, is that, was that through tapestry? Was that, uh, that part of that this was, That was from the health directors. Um, they, they installed those during COVID. Yeah. Yeah, but we, we, um, we dispose of the syringes after that, but, and yeah, but they did that on their own, it was great. Yeah. John? I don't have any questions. It seems clear to me and a positive thing to do. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, I think it's needed for our community. Uh, I think especially the trends and uh, uh, need a place for having a safe and confident uh, connection for people who are at high risk. I think this is a great way to do that. You know? Steve, any more I, I appreciate all those. I, I'm just thinking about if somebody asks me, I think I know more what to say. I appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a good discussion, that's for sure. A lot of learning to Any more discussion or can I have a motion? Emma, do you want to say anything about it? Yeah. yeah I I just I I'm so pleased that we we were able to bring this to the table and to the Board of Health. I I think this is really an exceptional moment for the Amherst community. Um that that Liz came forward and that uh, we've had this opportunity to discuss with her and that the board will take their vote shortly, I think. Um, I, I just, I, th I think it's, it's an, a demonstration of how far uh, we've come societal wise with understanding um, drug addiction uh, and, and the stigma around that. And, and I'm just really, I wanna thank everybody for being in this virtual room together. Oh, can I have a motion? A, I'll, I'll what, move that. Oh, go ahead, John. Wait. No, go ahead, Steve. Okay, I was just going to move that uh, the board approve the um, request from Tapestry to uh, provide the needle exchange or the, the let's say, syringe access program. Mobile harm reduction is okay. the oh, okay. title on the. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, technically, we're giving a we're, we're notifying the state that we are supportive of the program. Isn't that what we're doing? Correct. Okay. So how do we propose that in a motion? I mean, that's yeah. the, tech, the technical action. 
So and send a letter, right? Yes, and Liz, uh, Liz, do you send us the draft of the letter that we then send? I have a template, yeah, that, yes. that I can send you in the directions with who to send it to. Okay. So we're approving the program, but specifically we're approving uh, sending a letter to the uh, State Health, Health Department of Public Health right. that, to establish that program in Amherst. Right, that we approve of hosting to the tapestry program in Amherst. Yeah. The mobile harm reduction. Mobile harm reduction yeah. program. Because it, it, it encompasses, it's more than a syringe. Yeah. Yep. Thing. Oh, it, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. So it's Narcan, it's education, yep. it's connecting people to yep. treatment when they're ready right. for treatment. Um, and then they're also doing other health. Uh, so if they see someone with a wound or someone might be having cardiac problems from using, they'll help make referrals. So it's, it's 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 a bigger program than just syringes, but that's mm -hmm. um, and so that's important to tell people, Steve, that the syringe piece is a small piece of this, but it's really harm reduction for people who use, and it decreases chances of of needle sticks of employee of our town employees and um, people walking on the street in the garage and next to the toy box. Totally, yep. um, and those are all, I'm sure there are plenty more places people have seen needles. Okay, so what did I, what did I move? It's, it's, uh, it's only the, the it's, is it only the, the needle exchange part of, part of it that needs the approval from the town to the state, how, though? I mean, so to do all those other things, you wouldn't need their approval, but right. the syringe so thing. So we need uh, the right. implementation of the harm reduction program, including needle exchange. Right, okay. Have that, Steve? So we're moving we're, 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 that the board approve hosting the tapestry mobile harm reduction program, including needle exchange in Amherst. Okay. We have a second. I second it. Okay, now um, all in favor, Steve. Aye. Tim. Aye. John. Aye. Maureen. Aye. Nancy. Aye. Okay, unanimous. Aye. Thank you, Liz, for being here. Thank you, Liz. No, this is really Thank wonderful. You board Thank members you. for um, reading this and sharing your concerns and support. I really appreciate it. All okay. of your work. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. So is, is it is it Emma's task to inform the state? Is that what um I'll I'll email Nancy and Emma, maybe the template of the letter and the directions for who to send it to. Yeah, it's, we, it's the letter and then you need to send a copy of the minutes with the letter. So I'll get the letter ready and then when we approve our minutes at our April meeting, um, the letter and the minutes go to the state. This is what both Belchertown and Montague yeah. told me was the process. Makes sense, right? And then the state gets a hold of you guys, right? The tapestry? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, you, yeah. And then you have to make a yearly report. Yeah, I, I can come more than that as well. I'm, I'm really happy <laughs> as much as you like me to. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you, Liz, for bringing right. thank you. Okay. Yeah, Bye. thanks. So long. Bye. So long. Bye. Thank you. It was good to get done. Steve McCarthy and the tobacco regulations, the update, and this is on how the um, businesses are doing with our quiz for all employees that handle the sales of tobacco products. Hello, everybody. My name is Steve McCarthy. I'm the licensing coordinator for the town of Amherst. Um, I believe this is my first time meeting most of you. Mm -hmm. um, I work <laughs> in inspection services in town hall, and um, the bulk of my job is dealing with things like liquor licenses, restaurant licensing, helping businesses open up in Amherst. But I do dabble a bit in uh, health as well, and uh, tobacco is a part of that. Um, so this year with the pandemic, we've been trying to migrate most of our um, license applications online. Um, everything from residential rental permits to liquor licenses to, um, you know, food licenses and tobacco. Um, and um, we've been using the OpenGov uh, software suite, which has been really great. Um, it's, it's been much simpler for applicants and people to use. And it's got, um, you know, good access for the public to look at records and things like that. We're pretty, we're pretty delighted with it. Um, and so we did construct the tobacco license application for the businesses um, around the new year. 
Um, we were kind of uh, always playing catch up with this with, with COVID coming along and trying to frantically get everything online, but we were able to get most of our annual licenses made um, in time for the renewal at the end of the year. Um, and speaking with Emma a few weeks ago, she brought to my attention that part of the tobacco quiz um, and the regulations also includes that uh, each employee must also pass a quiz. Um, so I have developed an application in OpenGov um, for each employee to be able to take a quiz online and certify that they understand the regulations and so on and so forth. Um, so I thought um, I'd be happy to show you all that and, and uh, see what you think and if you have any suggestions. But I thought the best place to start would be to um, refresh you with what the quiz was on paper. Um, so this is um, what we would give out to applicants here. We would typically um, only get one back because they would, you know, I think they were supposed to have their employees just keep these on site. Um, but I did my best to recreate that um, as best I could in the software. Let me pull that up. There we go. Um, so we call it the tobacco handlers quiz. Um, and this is the form they would have to fill out. Um, they have to fill in their name, email address. That could be useful if there's ever any change in regulations or something where we have to notify them. Uh, what business they're employed by, um, the business address. Uh, they have to certify they are over the age of 21, which is, of course, one of our regulations. Um, there is a link to the Board of Health tobacco regulations and the um, Massachusetts Department of Health tobacco retailer guidance information. Um, now in the most recent um, regulation document that the Board of Health put out, um, there was a link included in there to, to this and it does seem to be out of date and broken. So I searched yeah. the state website and um, this was the closest thing I can find. Um, now I don't know if this seems like what, what you'd be looking for uh, for that. Yeah. yeah, that link, okay, yeah. great. Um, and uh, then they would have to go down and um, I think we might have to tweak this language a little bit. I just copied that verbatim from the old quiz and they have to check each of these boxes that they understand the different aspects of the regulations. Um, and at the very end, they do have to do a digital signature. And once they've completed that, it will go to me to review to make sure they have checked everything that they are over 21. And once they have been approved, they would get this certificate they can print out. And um, in lieu of the quiz itself being kept uh, on premises as the regulation state, that wouldn't really be uh, extremely easy with our software. I thought that a certificate like this printing out would probably suffice if you, if you also agree with that. Yes, and that quiz looks different than the quiz yeah. we provided you with. Um, I can go back and show you. I did attempt to copy it verbatim from the uh, the questions included on my 2015 edition of the application. Sorry about that. Call from Dr. There were actually questions, I thought, yeah. with yeah. options like with false or true, true or false and multiple choice. So, um, that could be. And this, um, this responsibility came to me just. Um, uh, about 18 months ago uh, when I switched positions and this has kind of been moving back and forth. So it's possible there is a piece of documentation that didn't make it to me. Um, this was included in our, in our paper tobacco application that we've been using for renewal as long as I've been involved. Um, this is the application here. And um, it says the permit holder of the establishment applying for the Board of Health tobacco sales permit must initial each of the statements below and sign the statement at the bottom. Uh, these are all the questions I used. Um, and it says, attention tobacco retailers, please make as many copies of page two of the permit application as you need so that all the appropriate persons may sign an initial copies of page two. Corporate officers and each local store manager must sign an initial copies of page two. So that, that was my best understanding is that that was probably the quiz. That's what we've been using for the retailers themselves. Um, it's possible that something got misplaced before this was all yeah. handed down to me. Um, and I would be happy to, to modify the quiz. Yeah. Uh, with our with, with the the uh, regulations we signed had a much different quiz with it. Mm -hmm. So do you have a copy of our June regulations and the quiz? Did that get sent to you? I do have a copy of the of the regulations. I don't believe I have a copy of the quiz. Okay, so I, I, 
<clears throat> I can follow up with that. Over. So Emma, do you want to send the quiz? Yeah, I'll follow up with that for sure. Mm -hmm. Now, how are we keeping track whether everyone who sells tobacco has taken the quiz? Now, that's a very tough question. Um, to my reading, nothing in the regulations states that they have to update a list of all their employees who are employed. They say they have to keep it on file in their store. Yeah, that's true. Um, we don't have any, any method in, in inspection services to go in and verify those things. Um, I guess we've been taking it on the honor system. Because my thought is, okay, we have this regulation, we passed it. Now, if we don't enforce it and check up on it, it it's... Now, Emma may be able sure. to speak more to this than I am, but I do know that there is an intertown compact that is tasked with enforcing the, uh, the tobacco regulations in yeah, Amherst. The PVTC does that with the inspections, Nancy. So we need to figure out how we're going to get this linked. The, the quiz we have in our regulations that we mm -hmm. voted on with what we say in our regulations, otherwise we're going to be a laughing stock and nobody's going to follow up on it. Well, if if um, we get the right quiz to see, they could produce, you could probably get that online and also have a certificate that could be kept in, in the uh, establishment for each employee, because uh, those employees are going to, you know, are likely to be changing in the course of the year. But I guess if the, the, the inspectors go in and say, who are your employees? Where are their certificates on this thing? That Would that work? Yeah, that would be easy for me to, if I had a different, you know, a new copy of the proper quiz, it wouldn't be difficult at all for me to set that up to have that, um, those questions be used. And that was my intention with the certificate was, um, you know, in the regulations, it says they should have a copy of the quiz, um, their completed quiz. And, you know, with, the, with this software, um, I thought, you know, a certificate on, on letterhead would probably suffice and be a, 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 a easier technical solution to that. But the intention would be that each employee would be required to print out that certificate once they pass the exam, uh, which would be graded by me or one of my colleagues. Um, and they would have to keep that on file at their store. What do you think, Nancy? Would you have a list of each store and who's taken the quiz? Um, we would have a, uh, a record of everybody who's taken it. There is that file of, uh, there is that question of what, which store they work at. Um, so there would, you know, we would be able to generate a, you know, an Excel sheet of everybody who's taken it, which would have information about which store they work at. That's great. That's because then maybe the people who are doing the inspections the, through the consortium can get those lists once or yeah. twice a year. That would be something I could provide. Other thoughts? Tim, Steve, John? I think uh, uh, the questions you have like understand is some sort of a second part of it, I think. I would say if you have the quizzes yeah, as a first part, they have to clear. Uh, and I also would suggest, you know, if there is any way to randomize them, Unfortunately, there's not. This software is uh, is a bit of a kludge to get it to to do quizzes. This is this software is really designed for you know building permit applications and um, <laughs> things like that. So uh, you know even even the grading will take a little bit of manual labor to kind of go through it. Um, but you know I think it I think it will work. And uh, instead of printing out your building permit at the end, it just prints out that certificate that you've passed it. Is there an argument for just using old fashioned paper and just giving each uh, each tobacco licensee a bunch of you know, some copies of the quiz and let them do it all. Yeah, I mean, um, for, you know, on, from the inspection services side, I mean, we've been really pushing very hard to get everything we administer online, just but not, not, not only because of COVID, but you know, especially with that, but just because of everything, there's a huge amount yeah. of paper that goes through our office and, um, yeah. you know, things get lost and mixed up and the, the transition to digital has been great. Yeah. Um, so in terms of things that we handle, I think that we would really be trying to move away from paper, but in terms of being able to provide the quiz to the licensees and, you know, leaving the responsibility in their hands that they have to administer this test to their employees and hold it um, and you know hold that past quiz on site. I mean that is the existing regulation, the existing practice. Um, and I would certainly have no objection with that. We wouldn't just have as much um, oversight, I guess, with you know, the, those databases we could produce. 
I like the online. Yeah. Yeah. It, it does sound like it, potentially it has all the information in, in an easier, an easier, somebody can access it mostly. Do the, <laughs> do the uh, people taking the quiz have to log on to OpenGov? They will have to make an account, yep. Oh, make an account, yeah. Okay. So they have to secure 100% score or is there a threshold when they will be passing? I'm sorry? I'm just, uh, you know, in terms of the points they get, like if they miss one quiz, will they still pass or? Um, well, I guess threshold? that's a that's a question for you. My understanding of the quiz what it was, was it, it was just that series of check marks. So um, whatever you guys are looking for out of the quiz, you know, what, what threshold you're looking to pass. And the question I was going to ask you is what, you know, if, is there an expiration on these? You know, how long should they be valid for? Is it a one-time thing if you're an employee? Is it something an employee yearly. would have to do yearly? yearly? Okay. It's so that they, and the, the whole thing is the tool so that the employer knows that the employee knows the regulations so they're not going to get find or have their businesses not be able to sell for three days it's really it's really to help in education it's not to be to be punitive it's to decrease the chances of an employee selling to an underage and it being found and then they lose their ability to sell and they get a fine and they get you know it, it, it's really a it's an educational tool Timothy remember that they can take it an unlimited number they of can times. right yeah they can they although can. yeah it, it's uh, you know it doesn't sound like the software is geared to this kind of activity but yeah. some things are you know you can take it until you get it all right you know that that's the kind of thing that would be ideal it's like it's like the uh the public uh, you know the freedom not the freedom of information but that thing that state thing that we're supposed to take uh, that you can do it as many times as you oh the uh Conflict of interest. Oh, open meeting. Open, open meeting law. Open, open meeting law. And conflict of interest too. Yes. But but yeah. that's but your system, Steve, doesn't really do that. It's not that's not what it's designed to do. No, and actually now yeah. that you mention that, I'm not even really sure how we would facilitate somebody taking it again other than them just filling mm -hmm. out an entire new application because it's um it, this, the software is great when it comes to, you know, you can have it go to, uh, you know, the fire chief and the plumbing inspector and have them all wait to sign off before you issue a building permit or something. But it's not quite so, no. so good at uh, having people take a test over again. I mean, a lot of ways, the, the paper quiz probably would be simpler. But, um, you know, but this is an option that, you know, Emma, Emma brought this to me as we went online. And uh, if this yeah. is something you're all interested in, it's well, something we can do our best to implement. We, we can try it and then evaluate it in six months and see what needs to be changed, what's working, what isn't working. How do we do this? So it's easy and it provides education and it helps people um, enforce the regulations. That's the whole purpose of it. Mm -hmm. Because often when we've gotten hearings because people are losing the ability to sell and the tobacco for three days or seven days and they've gotten fines and the fines have gone up. It's well, I had a new employee who didn't know who this or that. And th this is a mechanism to help them not have a new employee who doesn't know. And if that's the excuse, then they're not following the regulations. Another possibility would be to use some other, you know, existing, there's plenty of existing software that can easily do quizzes. And uh, but that, that's a whole nother ballgame, I guess. Mm -hmm. That's not something I have uh, you know, wouldn't be your, any your... experience in since my college days, maybe on the other side of it. But yeah, <laughs> yes. I, I wonder if we could make a Google form or something. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Like a Microsoft form. I don't, that, that's just where my brain goes, but I don't know. So Emma, do you want to email the quiz mm -hmm. to Steve? And Steve, you look at it and let us know what your thoughts are. Um, and then we can try it and then move forward um, and evaluate it in three months, six months. Um, Certainly, yeah. And um, what are other thoughts? Tim, do you have a all thought you, or John? All you professors, do you know of any software that does this? <laughs> well, Tim and John, all, I mean, there's all kinds of learning management, course management software, but that's yeah. not the path you're going to go on here. So. No. 
doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. I, I think it should be integrated with your already existing permitting software. Mm -hmm. uh, we should not have some sort of a people go mm -hmm. off into Google <laughs> Forms or anything yeah. like that and come back to this software. You know? so, yeah. so, so one thing I thought it might help for new employees is to have a fact sheet where, for reviewing. You know? So I think it might be helpful for, you know, because I think, you know, uh, just before they take the quiz, you know, if there is a fact sheet they could review and I'm just suggesting, you know, um, one page or two page fact sheet. Instead of just directing them to the regulations or something. I mean, just a highlighting right. ones, yeah. Right, right. Was that something we should do going off of our regulations? I, I believe we so. We want to do yeah. education. The royal we should, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, might... Which generally means Nancy. So anyway, that's good. I'm all for it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John. Um, do you want me to take a stab at that in the next month? And I'll, I'll email it out and see what people think of fact sheet for taking uh, the Amherst Tobacco Handlers quiz. Um, fact yeah. sheet for the regulation. It, you yes. know I mean? <laughs> yeah. well, I'm sure you could pull stuff from the, that document that, yeah. you know, for the tobacco sales guidelines, you know, just yeah. for, for retailers. I don't know. I mean, this will be helpful if there is going to be only one attempt. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. I'll look at the, I'll, I'll open up all my documents and look at the quiz and I'll come up with a fact sheet for safely, for, for, for making sure the regulations are upheld. I'll come up with some title and then, and then we'll look at it and then we'll get it to you, Steve, and see how you can get it in there. And also look at the quiz and see how you can put the quiz in, seeing that that's what we voted on last June. Um, yeah, I'm sorry for the miscommunication there, yeah, but um, it should be easy. Be okay. an older version from something else, you know that? Well, no, that, that all comes from the state. See, I and and I, was, I was trying to figure out with Julie, once the the um, you got separated from the board of health, the health department, because the inspectors and all used to be in the health department. Then you all got moved over. Although the licensing was separate, and I was when I was looking at what the state did and what, it, yeah, and I was trying to sort of piece that out with Julie, um, but and we just stuck to the regulations because that's what we are. But the whole licensing has, if you go online, they have this whole packet of things versus the regulations. Mm -hmm. So, so that's where we can, any other suggestions? We come up with a fact sheet to help with the quiz. Steve comes up with putting the quiz in the form. You can keep. You can still keep that state thing there. That's fine. Um, that you already have there, because that that's that comes from the state. The uh, I understand check mark yes, check boxes. That's yeah. From okay. The state. And our quiz is different. I see. They read that and then checked. They, they understood it, and then they took the quiz <laughs> right. and hit hundred. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll revisit this the fact sheet at the end, Steve, you can let us know if you could put the quiz in and then we can figure out where to go from there. That sounds good. And um, yeah, my, my uh, idea was that once this is all complete, I would send out an email to all of our licensees um, reminding them that all their employees have to take this quiz and that it's now online. So I will hold off until uh, our next meeting um, once I've had time to update that. And um, we have a fact sheet worked up to, to do that and we should be able to get it all out in one push. We can say they had a COVID grace period. <laughs> okay, any other thoughts, questions? Thank you, Steve. All right, well, thank you all. It's a nice pleasure to meet you all and nice finally put a face to the name yeah. I print on the bottom of all the licenses, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Have a great afternoon, enjoy the good you weather. You too, and thank you so much for your help. And all I right. like the online bit. Thank you. <laughs>
<laughs> Glad. Thanks. Okay, so we have all that. Next, we have standing item: the health inspector update for food, dining, seasonal events, and then well, septic, and inspections. Emma and I talked about this. Well, we skipped think... the prohibiting smoking in the work. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Goodness, Jeez. I wasn't. I wasn't too unhappy about that. But I'm um... sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, prohibiting the. Uh, Smoking and vaping in workplaces. I, I think I sent that to everyone like yes. last week. Um, I don't know if people got to take a look at it, but it's essentially the same as it was the last meeting, except the first paragraph was edited down right. to make it more concise and cleaned up and the right names and dates at the uh, names at the yeah. bottom and um, some headings and spacing and it, it, it seemed to be uh, you know I read it. I just had a formatting in our original can we get rid of all these lines I don't know where they came from they weren't in our prior what line what do you mean? so under town of Amherst there's a line regulation there's a line did you get all these lines on yours can you see my taps no 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 see, lines. I keep getting all these lines let me see. Let's be, see. Let's be uh, some let's strange see. formatting thing. Oh, no. Yeah. We didn't have oh. lines. No. no. Uh, every time I print it, I get these lines. And mm. I don't know why. OK. That no, was no. my only. No lines. That was my only comment. And then I just had a question for Emma after and when we pass these lines, uh, these regulations, I noticed outside the bangs, there's just a small sign. I wonder if we could do better signage around our town buildings and the parks about the smoking. Uh, because there is this, as you walk into bangs, there's this little sign right as you walk on the fence that you might not even see. So my question would also be about better signage in town. Um, uh, absolutely. I think that's a, uh, something that we can work on. And I think that we would have funding for. Yeah, for town owned playgrounds, parks, recreation, and then municipal buildings. Just um, those signage things. But I thought you did a great job. Maureen. It looks great. Yeah. Well, with help from other, all you guys. You and Steve, you did a nice job. No, I, I didn't notice this before, but I'm, I'm just looking at my copy and, and it seems to have a little bit of formatting that I didn't really see before that at the bottom of each, each page, it says approved XX, you know, at the effective date and a kind of a reddish brown line. Um, <laughs> I don't have that on mine at all. I just oh. have all these other lines. Yeah, that was that was taken from the the previous version. You know, yeah. as, as when we started, it had that. And I thought that's not a bad thing to have. No, it's not. I didn't that. I didn't notice it even when I right before I sent this out. I don't know. So yeah. but it, and it's just that if people see just one page, then they for some reason, then they orient. They know where, it. you know, yeah. you're right, because <laughs> even at the top of the page, it has a heading, um, yeah. which is, it's good. But I just wondered if everybody else was seeing those, because I don't think I saw them before I looked at it right this minute. Yeah. Um, I, it looks like you got the f section breaks or page breaks for a different first page, because the first page doesn't have the footer. The other pages do. So it's that's just a word format page break thing or something. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, different first page or something yeah. for the footer, but that's fixable by somebody. But I think the footer is a good idea. Okay. Yeah, no, but you know what you're looking at. Um, so I guess what's in the process now? Okay, so the process is, do we want to vote on this and do we want to pick an effective date? Well, we don't, we shouldn't vote before the public hearing or else the public oh, hearing is right. really, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My head is just, we need a public hearing. So yeah, that we, we, can, hearing. we can decide that we're all perfectly satisfied with it, with the exception of that one form or anything, which I'll take care of. And then we want to go ahead with the public hearing. Uh, yeah. The next mm -hmm. 
I think we should go with the meeting, the public hearing, yeah. We do it at our next Board of Health meeting in April? Sure. What, I, what about I, I just have to do date. the notice and the paper and stuff. Okay, yeah. Emma, can you to get that done? Mm -hmm. What effective date makes sense? I think we talked about July 1st. June 1st? Yeah, and that's, isn't that the uh, July 1st is calendar first. year for the town too? Fiscal year. Fiscal year. Fiscal yes. year. That's what I meant. By the, oh, man. <laughs> yes. Again, it sort of depends on when the hearing comes and what happens with the hearing and whatever, but tentatively, right? We technically, it does. Most likely, it won't change things. Yeah, because there isn't much of a change in. Right. No. Anything. It's just updating everything and making sure it has the uh, Alana electronics. Um, right. It just add it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the vaping. Yeah, it doesn't change. It expands some areas outside. So in this, we don't exempt the town common. So the no. town common is included now. The last one we exempted the town common because of Ganja Festival, which is gone. And then it would include Sweetster and Kendrick Parks too. Mm -hmm. So Emma, do you want to take care of getting this for the first item of our next? Yep. April. April. Eighth. Eighth. Okay. So we'll have a hearing, then we'll vote on it with, from what we think now is a July 1st effective date. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Now we can go on to new business. Sounds good. And as I was saying, Emma and I had a, a discussion, especially given with all the COVID regulations from the governor and everybody with open up eating places and um, other seasonal events. Although I do not think there's gonna be the taste of Amherst or the town fair this year mm -hmm. um, to make sure that the, um, in the health inspector, um, we get reports uh, on what's going on with the health inspectors and our restaurants and yeah. other food selling pieces. Yeah, I, I did reach out to Susan Malone. Um, uh, she said that she didn't have anything specific to um, update on today. Um, but with that, we do know that uh, outdoor dining will be starting again very shortly um, as spring is coming upon us. So that's coming. Um, the farmer's market did uh, make a proposal I believe they were presenting to town council if they haven't already done so very soon. Their plan does include um, <clears throat> limiting the amount of people that would be on the common in addition to like social distancing, having uh, hand sanitizers available and then a traffic flow pattern. Um, and also I know Ed's here to speak about um, the next agenda item, but I wonder if he has something to add maybe as well. I just put you on it as a pan. Look at that beautiful background. Mm -hmm. You're muted, Ed. I think it's the same place as Maureen's picture, different scene. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. And both of them still have that tree and it's now gone. Yes, I have something from that view too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, we have a, I think, a fairly routine well proposal. 
Uh, this is a lot that appears not to have been built on before, integrity construction. Um, I'm not sure if Anna Novi Cook is in the waiting room. Um, she had the link and I said that she certainly could attend. I'm not sure if she would be here. Um, she's from Integrity Builders. Yep, she's here and I just promoted her to a panelist as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep, um, and um, there's Anna. Hello. Hi. I did notice one small mistake in the, um, the letter of support that I wrote. The picture number three is actually looking to the east from the well location. And then we spun around 180 degrees and number four actually is the view to the west. But it's not a level lot, but um, there's the location is at the rise at the top um, and is accessible by the drilling equipment. So I really don't anticipate any issues with this site. Tim and John, always I'm grateful the two of you are on our <laughs> Yeah, um, I was just curious if you could tell me where, if I were to pull up Google Maps, where I would see this. If you pull up 96 Flathills Road, this is the lot just to the south of it. Thank you, I'll do that. Oh, oh, 94, 94 and 66. 94 Flathills? Correct. Okay, just curious where it is. Yeah. Kind of towards world. the southern end. Yep, I see that now. Okay, yeah, near where it goes up mm -hmm. on the west side. Well, is it on the east side or the west side of the Flathills Road, This the oh, lot? The west side. Just, side. just above the steepest section of Flathills, just as it starts to kind of taper out. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah too high for the public water. I've always had my class design the extension up there, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it looks like it ends a couple houses south, according to the town map. Yeah. Yeah. Up, up, what's, uh, what are the, I didn't even look at the map. Are the real elevations on the map there? Oh. I don't know. I do have a topo map. If I'm allowed to screen share, I could pull that up. I mean, I saw some uh, elevate. I was just thinking there's some yeah. elevation somewhere. Yeah. Uh, those are those aren't real elevations. Right. <laughs> those are relative to some t temporary benchmark. Where Usually, the is. top of the foundation wall, I think. Well, there's no existing foundation wall, right? So it's got to be some. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's got to be some real thing. All there the it repair is. Plans. I got it. Benchmark pin and pole 11496. That's a strange number. That's, I mean, yeah. that is at 400 feet elevation, which is why it doesn't get water, not 115 relative to sea level anyway in Boston. Mm. Uh, that's a weird, weird elevation. Hmm. I wonder what it shows it's a funky one <laughs> i was just curious what the real elevation was but it's all right yeah if, am, am i allowed to screen share i could show you the topo map that uh, randy Iser did well i'm looking at a topo map of the Wait, site okay. it's just that the numbers on the lines don't make sense with real elevations that's all i see i see okay <laughs> i mean real meaning yeah yeah, it doesn't matter. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> just curious. So the well, so it's sloping down from the road. Yeah, the lot generally slopes north to south, like in, in line with flat hills. But as you go from flat hills to the west, it kind of undulates up and down a little bit. All from patient to cook. Yeah, I mean, it's actually sloping down to the north on this plan, even though generally you're going up. Unless, oh, wait a minute, never mind. I got my north messed up. 
at least I can't even find north on this, but since you said it's on the west side, then that north has to be down to the right on this plan. Okay. Yeah, there's a north arrow yeah. up there in red. Got it. <laughs> north arrow up there in red, so. It's on his checklist for the septic plan, so it better be there. <laughs> yeah. North arrow up there in red. Got it. Yeah. We try to leave something easy off for you guys to catch. You know? uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. What's the size of the lot? The the part shown here is about an acre, but they're buying four acres in total. The lot on paper, there's there was some potential that this was one building lot and there was a flag lot behind it with its frontage on the south side, and they're buying both together. So it's four total. Mm -hmm. okay. No, let me know Yeah, I don't have any technical questions. So. May they hit good water, not too deep. <laughs> Always the question. When you drill, you never know. It's always an allowance for us in our contracts, the well cost. <laughs> mm. But anyway, this is on a, it's got a lot of, a lot of topography above it. So that's, yeah. That's good. I would just add, I just saw one thing in the letter. It says mm -hmm. you visited the site on 3-5-2023. Oh dear. <laughs> so I think that- Wow, Ed. <laughs> well, I'm gonna... It is pandemic, I know. Well, it's hard right. to know Ed's a negative. time traveler. Yeah, really? <laughs> what, a lot of use of this. Um, what, what else happened then, Ed? <laughs> you know, there has been a lot happening, totally unpredictable. <laughs> it's, it, this is interesting days to be a health inspector. <laughs> <laughs> and a health director. Boy. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. And a health board. Do mm -hmm. not envy your jobs <laughs> during this time. This is this, uh, yeah, okay, okay. So this, it was the 2021, it was just last Friday. I think, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. Um, if there's any, Ed, if there's anything else you think we should look at, uh, Mm. I don't think so. Um, there'll be some other well business coming to future meetings, but um, we'll send that along, uh -huh. you know, in, for next month, perhaps. Um, I know the town is discontinuing, or the town is adding some customers to the public water mm -hmm. um, from, is it Leverett or Shootsbury? Um, Leverett. Yeah. Leverett. Okay. Five or six wells, I think, are being discontinued up there. Yep. Um, I don't think that impacts the board. Um, no. Yeah. No. Nothing, it's, nothing else on wells. That's the landfill contamination in Leverett of those wells. That's why the extension, extension's happening. Well, the, uh, just as one other general thing, there was a, um, I haven't received it yet, but I was told by a well drilling um, representative that um, there may be a major project, a major geothermal project coming to us. And I won't get into the specifics, but um, in the past, we've permitted those at $50 per proposal. This one is going to eclipse perhaps anything that we've ever brought. Um, it could be um, some hundreds perhaps of wells is what I was told. So um, I think that will be $50 per borehole, which the person asking didn't flinch at at all, but was saying he thought that that was in line with other projects that they've done. So I just wanted to say that there 
I'm yeah. going to try to get you information about this project as soon as I get any firm evidence about it. It is. Well, actually, we don't, we don't need to bother Anna with this. <laughs> I have a question about that, but that's a different subject. Okay. But yeah. I'm just curious if it's um, uh, traditional in the sense that the, the holes are just conduits to move water through for, for heat transfer. They're not actual any kind of extraction of groundwater. I think that's right. The former, like like what we've done for other, yes. it's just just simply a conduit to make use of the heat sink or gain from the from the ground, right? Yeah. Okay. I think so. So it's kind of weird that I, I brought this up before. I don't understand why we we permit them as wells. They're not wells at all. They're holes in the. They're long. They're narrow, skinny, deep excavations. <laughs> is what they are. But they, if things happen during the course of construction. Yeah. Could impact the groundwater, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so just, we, it's just odd to call it a well. Oh, okay. Well, he was calling them boreholes, so mm -hmm. that was. It is a borehole. That yeah. is accurate. Yeah. That is accurate. Okay. So more, more to come later. Hmm. It's a different subject than um, than a well for extraction of potable or agricultural water. But yeah. Interesting. All right. Okay. I don't. I don't have any questions about the well, personally. So, what? What's next, uh, Nancy or Emma? I guess we okay. we approve. We need to move. Do we need to have a motion to approve the the well permit? Right. For ninety flat hills. Can I ask a couple of questions? I know that. Oh, I'm sorry. Has been um, I'm just curious, you know, what is the level of use of that well in terms of pumping? How many, I mean, it's probably used for one family, right? It is, yeah. It's a single yeah. family home, two occupants. Okay. And they also, I mean, I, I think uh, Ed mentioned that there's not going to be any water body, you know, close by or but it looks like in the downstream there is a brook. Um, I don't know what, what name of it, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's essentially draining to that, right? So I'm just curious, you know, if there is potential impact on the flows there, and but it may not, you know, but it, it all depends on the pumping rate. You know, so. My understanding is we're far enough away from that, but it, on mm -hmm. the map on the far west side, you can see some wetlands delineated, which are outside of the 100 foot radius off the well. And those were just recently flagged last week. Um, I guess I'm not aware of a stream over there, just, just those wetlands to the west there. Yeah, there are a couple of uh, branches coming in, you know. There's okay. a copy you're looking at. What, what I'm, I'm looking, looking at, at Oliver. I, it's a GIS map, you know, of the location. So it's a little bit more information there, you know. So, so, so that Google is a maps. confluence of two brooks very close by on the west side. Uh, I think that that flows into the Heatherstone or something brook. Oh, okay. So I'm just curious, you know, if uh, how far is it, and is there any going to be any influence on the flows there? You know? But it may not be. You know, it all depends on the pumping rate and the depth. I would yeah. imagine it. it's going to yeah. intercept an aquifer way below those surface features at that location anyway. But mm -hmm. yeah, maybe, maybe not. Yeah, I don't know if we if we can find out the depth of the wells for the houses on either side. If that would be any any, any indication of what we're going to end up doing. I can look on the the state well drillers um, or the well logs for the state. Okay. Which is a house across the way. It does say something intermittent stream on one of those maps that is included in the packet. Mm -hmm. Or something. There's a green line under. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. That's labeled. Yes, sir. Mine is sideways here. That's, yeah, uh, no, I'm looking like that too. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, Which intermittent map? 100 feet from resource area to west intermittent stream. Yeah. Yeah, so there's like an off 100 foot offset off that stream is shown which just eyeballing it looks like maybe 25 feet off the well. That 100 foot setback is maybe 25 off the well. Which, which map are you guys looking at? There's, there were two, there's one that shows like some orange lines of like protection from the- uh, what's, what's the name of the file? I, I only see what? one map. I'm just looking okay. for the file. I, uh, the one that's 03 point. 05 PDF. It's like Flathills Road Plan revised with well and wetland changes. Wow. I don't see that one. Okay. I have a couple of well depths here. Number um, 134 is 385. Uh, 180 Flathills is 440. It says McLaughlin Flat. Got it. That one didn't extract when I did my extraction. Now I get it. Thank you. Go, go ahead, Ed. What'd you say? Oh, 83 flat hills is 280 feet. Oh. Um, yeah. One thirty three is two sixty. So Tim, are you saying you, you want to see some more data or something that we don't usually see? Or what, what are you asking? <laughs> I'm just curious. Well, I'm, I'm not asking for more data, but I'm, I'm just uh, thinking about this uh, aspect of the closeness to an intermittent stream. I, it all de that's why I said you know, it all depends on the pumping rate, you know, how, how, okay. how much we are going to extract. And so but it may not be a critical issue. Um, is, uh, can, can I ask Ed uh, one more question? Uh, I'm sure there is a culvert right below the Henry Street. A culvert below Henry Street? No, uh, yeah, I think uh, just close to west of that property. Um, I don't know. Yeah, there is a couple of these uh, intermittent streams are draining or crossing the street, is right, Henry Street. I mean, it would make sense. It's generally sloping that way, so yeah, yeah I'm sure, exactly. I'm sure, there's plenty of them. <laughs> Yeah, so it should be in the proximity. That's why I was uh, curious, you know, how much is the influence on that, you know? But. For what it's worth, the house design, it's just in the beginning stages of design, but it's going to be built to passive house standards, low impact, low energy use. So I understand the well capacity and the pump might provide more than the homeowners are intending to use, but as the ultimate goal is a pretty low impact house. Sounds good to me. Okay. <laughs> okay, so what's our steps, okay, folks? Nancy? So we need a motion to accept the well. The part the Application for a permit. The application to, to, to the drilling well. permit, I think, is what it actually is, right? Mm -hmm. And the septic, right? It, it so the septic is something I approve traditionally. Okay. I you welcome know. the way in on it. But. No, it's fine with me. I, I'm still figuring <laughs> okay. out what we do and what we don't do. Yeah, th there is a second step to this process that after the well driller's data is in and testing has been done on the water. Yeah that um, that information will be brought back to the board for yep. a water supply certificate. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Ed and Anna. So we need to, 
Do we need a motion and a vote? Yeah. yeah. Are you making the motion, John? <laughs> I guess I approve. I I did it before. I think I move we approve the uh, the permit for well drilling for the lot on Flat Hills Road, whatever the number is. I'll second it. Okay. That's all enough. in favor? Steve. Yeah. Aye. Tim. Aye. John. Aye. Maureen. Aye. Nancy, aye. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Happy Thank drilling. Right. Happy drilling. <laughs> Thanks, Ali. Great. Thanks. Designing. <laughs> okay. Great. Okay. What's next for us? Next is the COVID okay. reports. You yeah. Know these cases, testing, vaccine distribution. I'm going to exit. I was actually right. party. See, see Ed. <laughs> Thanks, Ed. Thank, Thank you, Ed. Ed. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. So, in terms of COVID um, testing, uh, the UMass site continues at this time to do uh, county, you know, available testing to the public several days a week. Um, you can go in there moments. It's, it's free of charge. It's uh, provided by the state. Um, they are seeing lower rates of uh, testing engagement throughout the state. So that's just, it's still a resource that's here and available to us. Um, in terms of local testing, uh, I, I did um, do some mobile testing for uh, some children uh, of a childcare program that had some identified transportation language cultural barriers uh, to be able to go to a different site that really needed access to COVID testing after uh, an exposure. Um, and that was done this weekend. So uh, I was really proud of, of our department um, and our board that, that we were able to coordinate that with Dr. Kate Atkinson and Cooley Dickinson with Dr. Levin and Kathy Reed with the lab uh, to be able to bring that service to those families in need. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of count case counts, um, this past week we've had 66 cases in Amherst. When I pulled the report, uh, five of those of the total were non-college related, 58 of them were UMass, two of them were Amherst College and one was Hampshire College. Of all of those, um, 69 of the cases were between the ages of 17 and 23, and seven of them were 27 and older. 59 between. 59. Yeah, it was yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 59. And then um, in terms of vaccines, we've done just over 5,000. Uh, we've also, in, at our Amherst sites, we've also done 60 homebound. Uh, that includes six towns um, in our surrounding area as well. UMass stated today, they've just done a little bit over 12,000, um, which is exciting. In terms of vaccine availability, it does is still extremely, um, constricted with supply. Uh, we are partnered with Northampton as a regional site. They're the primary site. We're the satellite with them. Uh, under that agreement, we are uh, we get 23% of the allocation. Uh, we are both sites that have a lot of capacity. We have a big uh, volunteer force um, and staff that are ready to go, uh, but we just need the supply. So that's a challenge. Um, uh, in addition to that, uh, with the clinics that were recently transferred back to the Bang Center, um, our first clinic there, we had a lot of um, opportunities for growth with how it was set up outside. We didn't have, um, the tent wasn't set up quite yet. Uh, we, I think with having the bigger space at the high school, there, there was obviously more space to be uh, um, accommodating. And with the bangs, it can be pretty constricted in that foyer. Uh, so we did uh, do some after action review, redid the spacing inside in the queue area. That tent is outside now for to keep people sheltered from the elements. Um, we also helped identify, um, you know, risks for, for the curbs and everything like that outside with fall risks and transfer challenges, which I know were brought forward and we definitely take seriously. Uh, we've also 
uh, re revisited um, what documentation we're sending out with our patients with the COVID cards. We now print out labels with those lot numbers for the vaccine that go right on the cards when they come in. And then this past week and week and a half, we've now been, uh, we've initiated giving a placeholder card for your second dose appointment. And then we book it uh, for those individuals uh, with our um, robust interns uh, and other people that are assisting us with clerical assistance as well. Um, so individuals don't have to go through that, in my own words, nightmarish process of trying to sign on with through PrepMod and all the registration. Uh, so we assist with that. Um, other updates in terms of vaccine, I've been in some discussions with the housing authority with Pam Rogers to really par partner with them and be their, um, not sponsor, but to help be their partner for vaccine distribution to uh, senior and affordable housing um, in those communities. Uh, also, I've been in discussions with John Liebman from the John Mizanti Health Center, uh, certainly with their clinic set up downstairs. It's very narrow. It's kind of a, a railroad set up. It's not set up to do big clinic um, vaccine distribution, but we are working with them to see how we can assist them with vaccinating their, their clients, their patients, uh, as well as assisting with doing some targeted outreach to their identified population, Salvadorian, um, Cape Verdean, and other uh, groups as well. Um, and then in addition to those, uh, I talked briefly about our homebound program, which uh, we're really excited about. Um, the, uh, I have a, another meeting tomorrow with Chief Nelson, um, but so far it's been really a successful collaborative effort uh, with the Eastern eight Hampshire County communities among Council on Aging's um, boards of health or health departments with public health nurses uh, and fire the fire department um, having a shared uh, Excel spreadsheet that's secure for us um, and then scheduling their appointments, going and doing like a visiting nurse route um, to them and Amherst and some other communities like Belchertown and Granby, we actually went out with the ambulance, which was really exciting. Um, <laughs> but thinking about the, the future of the plan moving forward and making expanding on the model um, and what would that look like, uh, especially since the state is going to be, um, there is this state branch of the program for homebound um, that will be coming out in the next couple of months. But really thinking about our, our communities in Hampshire County and Western Massachusetts, um, the, the unique uh, care that we can give them from us as a local board of health and health department, um, taking care of our own. And then also we can have some assurance um, in terms of communicating with our public, those community stakeholders that we're partnering with, and then also having the, the great, the good customer service and delivery that we can give um, rather than going straight with the state private program. Um, and then teachers are coming up, which I know is really exciting. We had a meeting today with Northampton about that with how are we gonna help support our teachers? Cause certainly we wanna do that. Um, but with vaccine allocation being so constricted, it's, it's a real challenge, but trying to overcome those barriers to still be able to make sure that we're hitting those uh, teachers and faculty because it does have that trickle down impact to our, our families and our kids. Um, so we're problem solving that and hoping that that plan will be solidified by, by the end of this week. Um, so we can do some teacher vaccines. And I think that's it for um, vaccination stuff. In terms of uh, we, we continue some to questions on, yeah. on vaccination. Okay, the homebound, uh, another board of health uh, not ours, but sent me that survey and asked me how we were going to answer it. So I hadn't gotten it. Had you gotten that survey that was for the boards of health? Mm -hmm. um, so I answered that because it's for local board of health. It, it's not for the health director. Um, okay. Is that is that how it goes? I, I, I think so. I also received it and I, I interpreted it that as I'm the 
agent for acting on the local board of health that okay. I performed it on, on the board's behalf. Okay, but, but, but the board should be informed about actions like that. Cause I was, yeah, I so, was taken by surprise when uh, uh, some other boards of health people called me. I, see, I get all these calls because my name's up there as chair. Yep. Um, so we so, should be informed, even though you're the agent, we shouldn't be blindsided. So the, the form actually came out last week, Nancy. We've been doing this homebound program for about three weeks, even before the state announced their plan yeah. for a homebound program. Nice. Um, we were the first homebound program in the state. Uh, we really pioneered kind of, um, and we're trendsetters that way. So, so the thing is, we I should not have been blindsided about the form because because I got the call from a neighboring town because they had some homebound people and they wanted to know how we were filling it out because they knew we were making visits and what was happening. And I said, well, what form? So she then sent me the form. And so I just, I feel like if, if a form that goes out to the board of health, that it, it, we should get it so that if we get these phone calls, we're not blindsided. Um, just okay. Was ha, just ha, the communication. Ha, yeah, I think the the challenge too is is just the how quickly this everything's going out and being done by the state, um, mm -hmm. and okay. needing to be approved before we even had this meeting. Um, it wasn't. It, no, it's, just, it's due next week. It's just just getting that information. So when I get a phone call, I don't have to stumble. And she said, "What do you mean? You're the chair of the board of health. Why haven't mm -hmm. you? Why don't you know about this?" Mm -hmm. It was a chair from another board of health who called mm -hmm. me because she had a had some homebound people and wanted to know how we were answering that question. Mm -hmm. That do, survey. Do you guys? Does the board of health for Amherst not have their own email? No. No. Oh, because no. the Board of Health in other towns where there's still a health department do have their own email. No, we so don't. So I guess that's something it. that I'm learning. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it was just that I would got blindsided and I said, oh, yeah. but I know we've been doing it. And I said, no, I'll talk about it because the ne it, it's not due till Friday and I'll make sure it comes up at the board meeting. And she was reassured because she didn't know what we were doing. And she just wanted to know because she's in our catchment area. Uh, for the homebound. Well, so. uh, maybe a lot of these smaller towns don't have a health director, and so it goes to a different a different route. Oh, right. yeah, it, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. But yeah. because we have a health director, you got this, Emma, and yeah. the, board, the board didn't see right. this. Yeah, so when you see that, because it said local board of health, just forward it to us so we know that it's, it's just communication so we know that it's happening. Yeah. And sure. take action as you should have. <laughs> just so yeah. did you submit this, Emma? Yeah, Good. yeah, I submitted it. Good. Okay. Good. 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 Just Good. tell us. Good. But, <laughs> Good. but just just so that we're not and, and because my name's up there, that's why yeah, these yeah. phone calls come to me. And so I just said, Oh, I will just check in on that. We've been very yeah. busy with the clinics. I know we've been doing home visits. So I just covered it all. And that's when I then sent it out because this other so you, board so you clicked, called me. So you clicked option one. Mm -hmm. my Good. my local board of health chooses to take yeah Good. yeah Good. and and actually that's part of what um my meeting is with with chief nelson tomorrow um i've drafted a a, a continued plan uh pilot um draft of the plan um that i want you know uh chief nelson to sign off on moving forward um i know meredith o'leary is really excited about this program potentially being of value for all of Hampshire County. Um, yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. Can you send us that a copy of that? Please? Yeah, absolutely. Great. That's fantastic. So Emma, this is extremely time consuming. Mm -hmm. And so I just wondered what you've envisioned for staffing it and whether yeah. volunteers are a part of that or whether it's all from a professional staff. That, that's a great question. So it is pretty time consuming. It's basically uh, developing visiting nurse routes uh, based on the communities that you're serving. Um, we have an Excel spreadsheet with the current previous schedule for what communities have been had vaccines and on what dates and what would be their second doses and of what vaccine. Um, we were able to do 12 Granby homebound within four hours. 
That's with impressive. the ambulance doing a leapfrog model of care, meaning that um, us, the Amherst team, we would vaccinate and then it, in Granby, the Granby fire and EMS crews would stay with the patient for that observation yeah. period That's that really decreased. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yep, that decreased our observation time. And then in other times where each patient takes about half an hour to 45 minutes, um, you get there, you, they're all pre-registered. You go, you do your initial assessment for the just-in-time uh, questions and assessment before you give them the vaccine. And then really during the observation t- period is when you can do your documentation in the computer system. Um, we have go bags for these uh, nurses, which will probably be hired per diem nurses for this, um, that would be provided under CARES funds. That's great. CARES funds is what is state funds? Uh, yeah, it's the state and federal funds. State and federal for funds. For COVID CARES, response. CARES Act. Mm-hmm. CARES Act. CARES yeah. Act. Oh, okay. How, Emma, how, is, um, how are people in need, individuals in homes identified? Who has a list of that? Yeah. Is that where the fire, where does that originate from? Yeah, so there's a lot of different lists. Uh, like our library in Amherst has a list that they do <laughs> deliveries for. Councils <laughs> on Aging's have a list. Okay. But there are also, even with those two great lists, there are so many people that that aren't um, right. elderly or and are homebound. So one thing that we've done, um, Brianna Sundred, the communications director and I, we together developed a a Google, not a Google, but a Microsoft form that people can fill out. That's very, that follows that algorithm, Nancy, that you might've seen on the PowerPoint for the local boards of health with the same types of questions. Uh, Are you able to leave your home with a separate person or do you require an ambulance or a two person assist to go out? Um, Those same questions for How do do you try to reach those people to give them that? Yeah, so that's part of the, yeah, so that's part of the final PowerPoint, uh, the present agreement with Chief Nelson tomorrow is so we can get this out officially to our communities. So before, uh, before tomorrow afternoon, if it's approved, uh, we've been get- receiving calls and from councils on aging, obtaining that information or local boards of health, like with um, so just- the Quabbin. Quabbin Health District, Amy Langone, their public health nurse, has worked really in in a conjunction, a tandem with Jessica Langless, their outreach, their um, so just network director. networking. I mean, there isn't Network, a, there's mm-hmm. no one formal way to do this. Absolutely. Well, that's one thing that we're trying to streamline with this form. Individuals, if they are tech savvy, can fill out the form on our website uh, or councils on aging and health departments can. Also, we're going to be hopefully opening our health department line and the COVID concerns line as well, where our COVID ambassadors and phone takers can go through this form, this process to see if people can enroll in the program and if they're, they're, they would fall into it and be acceptable. So, so this the homebound program to date, have you advertised it at all? Is it on our website or have you just so, done it word of mouth? So it's been pretty much word of mouth with the eight communities. Um, beyond that, I think WWLP did a quick two minute thing and, and put up the, the senior center numbers for the, the eight towns. Um, but that was several weeks ago. It was so on there the hasn't website that you have done this. I mean, not yep. that was an advertisement, but it was a public, you know. Uh, yeah, I, I think promotion. Brianna might've put up the, um, the form tonight. Mm -hmm. on the website. So you might find that as a new addition. Do the area agencies on aging such as um, Highland Valley or West Mass have they, do you have any input from them? Yeah, so there there's some communication challenges Uh, in terms of Western Mass. I know South Hadley has been really trying to diligently work with them Um, in terms of information sharing that there seems to be that they can't share information in terms of their clients. Mm -hmm. They are willing to give flyers to their clients talking about this program. So that's one thing that Sharon Hart has been trying to work on with them. Mm -hmm. Uh, She's the the South Hadley director. Um, So so there are some challenges. 
How has and, Highland Valley been for you? Have they been, because I've heard they've had a change in leadership. Yeah, um, yeah I've reached out to them twice and haven't really had a good response back. Really? What I'm hoping for is mm -hmm. that once we're, once I communicate with Chief Nelson tomorrow, and if we get the go ahead with expanding this program because we've had a successful few weeks on this smaller model, that with the growing it out with the support of Northampton, growing it out into the Western part of Hampshire County, mm -hmm. um, that because of it being a larger in, 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 uh, area that higher Highland Valley will be more invested. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Mm. The, I had another question as you're developing processes and procedures. Have you developed a process for a, a fair and equitable for your extra um, remaining doses at the end of clinics? Yes. So Jen Brown um, sent to me, oh, now I'm not going to be able to find it, but the it's the ASIP yeah, I've, um, I've looked at that. It's yeah for and uh, morbidity. Um, ACIP. Yeah, yeah, they did it, and it was published in um, the weekly morbidity and mortality report. I think it was published through them. Yep. Um, yeah. So I know that this last night um, I was calling waitlist individuals sorted by age mm -hmm. up until eight o'clock last night. I called fifty people and was able to enroll three people for our clinic today um, and that were wait initially waitlisted. Following our clinic today, we had three doses. I also went down the waitlist again, sorted by age and was able to get three people by that. Emma, can you delegate some of this? This is for, for being the health director. There's so much leadership. Can you delegate yeah. some of this? Yeah, absolutely. And, and certainly looking forward to that. Um, Jen Brown has taken a few days off yesterday, today, and Friday. Um, mm -hmm. So normally she would be taking that on. Mm -hmm. um, we're really looking forward to these two additional interns being onboarded to be able to assist with that as well. Okay. Cause I, I really <laughs> would like to support you. And if we need to ask <laughs> Paul for more help, that you can do the leadership rather than all of the down in the ground mud because as we start opening we're going to need so much leadership in all the possible issues problems to keep everything going yeah i i think that's definitely something that um has been heard um uh we're hoping to get more administrative support as well coming up mm -hmm. uh, for additional admin um so that way i can kind of pull back a little bit as a wider lens um we're also still trying to onboard that contact tracing support position. That's a, a CARES position to really have that tight um, focus on the COVID exposures, tracing that's going on in, in Amherst to really follow that. And then also um, we do have an offer out and it was accepted for the vaccine site coordinator position. And uh, that's Michelle Moore and um, she's, expected to start March 22nd. So that'll take a bit a lot off the plate too. What's her background? Yeah, Michelle Moore, she was a Perkins Scholar at Mount Holyoke. Oh. Um, she's initially from this area. She was briefly out West staying with children during the pandemic. Um, she did state some history with working with UMass during alumni events, uh, great volunteer engagement. Um, and also has roots in this area. So I'm really excited about her coming back out and, and joining our team. Is that a full-time position for you? It is a 20, ugh, 25 to 35 hours a week um, position for the vaccine Good. coordinator. It'll be great. Mm -hmm. And she's got great energy, Good. which is fantastic. Good. Yeah. Great. Um, so I think that's it for me. I know, oh, one thing that today was an informational session on um, Public Health Excellent Grant Program. Uh, this is a, a grant program uh, up to $300,000 for possible shared or regional services um, that are new plans or expanded agreements um, from previous years. 
and, and I was interested in that because certainly any opportunity that we have to expand services in Amherst uh, and support other um, smaller health departments, like you said, John, um, is good. But I, I know that I'm new to my position and I certainly want to hear the room's ideas here on, on possible ways that things that you could see being beneficial to our local community or partners or anything like that. Grant from who, Emma? I'm sorry, what did you say? Uh, who's the grantor? Uh, DPH. State, state, state DPH? Yep, state. So uh, the request for proposals is due by the end of this uh, month. Um, official MOUs with those communities is not expected until July. Um, so right now it's just kind of like the, what are the, what could we possibly do? Um, so regional work is, is much, much needed. But the pros and the cons of Massachusetts is that we have 351 <laughs> health departments and some towns don't want to give some of that up. This may have changed over COVID. So um, one thing I really hope I can see you be able to do is build our health department. It has been, we need a good public health infrastructure. And the Amherst Health Department has been whittled away over the past two decades, especially the past decade. So along with going regional, I think we really need to look at how we can build up our department that we can spread some regional pieces. And that's why I asked if you have more help so that you can take a leadership role mm -hmm. in building up our department because it has been desecrated. I mean, we, they used to have a, you know, all the inspectors used to be there. We used to have, used to have a full-time um, administrative assistant. Um, it's just years ago for 20, 30 years, you, you even had a home care department and the school nurses used to be under you. And then everything's gotten pushed away when it used to take up the whole top floor of Bangs Plus to you got these two little rooms, you know, together. So not only the space, but that's how big it had been. And then it's just been shrinking over the past several decades. So that I'd like you to be able to, to grow that and maybe some things, um, with the senior center, with New Santi, with Craig's doors for some of our, and, and I liked how you were reaching out to some of the minority populations that, that we need to, I don't know if I'm, I'm blabbing on too much, but I'd like to see some growth in all of that mm -hmm. um, area. And then also going a little regional, but I think you need to get our department looking like we can do a regional rather than a full-time director and a part-time nurse, and now you're getting some other, but those positions can disappear with the CARES money too. So. Well, well, yeah, I mean, we're in the process right now of, of budget hearings. Um, we just had our initial one a few weeks, last week. Um, I, I am proposing a, a, a permanent administrator and an additional part-time nurse um, for the next year. Uh, we're also looking to hopefully acquire um, through CARES funds as well. Uh, I've proposed a mobile health van for the health department uh, where we could do vaccinations, testing. It could be used um, potentially for Craig stores, for, for uh, medical care, um, and also for events and education. There, the options are endless, um, but Primarily, we want our focus right now to be on the COVID response for it to be eligible for those care fund, CARES funds. Um, but I agree, Nancy. I, I think part of showing that our department is going to be big is, is trying um, to show our ability for growth um, by not necessarily regionalization, but if there's any kind of shared services uh, mm -hmm. that we can blend in there. Um, show our worth and, and our efforts together to be able to keep that sustainability going. So as any of these positions come up, see if you can get someone with an MPH who has a solid public health background. Um, 
who can look uh, uh, in the larger picture of public health. Comments from other people? Uh, Emma, I'm gonna uh, uh, suggest something that could be on our board of health or our health department webpage. You, you bring up health issues and stuff. I guess I would uh, suggest and I can pr maybe provide some contact is to promote the, the current program that I'm trying to, I'm helping the state implement on free testing of lead in uh, drink and drinking water for family, all childcare providers. I, I, got, I got two students starting a, working their way down a list of 8,000 child care providers in the state that we're, call, we're calling because uh, we've had this program and we've gotten 110 applicants out of 8,000 possible because everybody's just trying to trying to work and take care of kids. I mean, it's so low priority, but we could have something about lead, uh, uh, you know, for child care providers. I don't know where I'm looking. Yeah. I'm looking at the website for child care providers or child care stuff on the on the town website. There isn't much. That yeah, see. Jen, we can we can update that. Jen Brown um, usually does our website, but I can definitely <laughs> move that forward. Well, I'm just thinking of something to promote. Uh, yeah, and I can give you the link, and uh, that'd be great. Yeah, we we sent out magnets and po and postcards. Um, that's one thing that, that could, we could do. It's, it's not about a grant. It's, I'm just sort of brainstorming about things to do. Um, certainly staff-wise, like Nancy said, seems to make sense. Um, Are there services or educational initiatives that you can see going regional um, that would be part of that? I'm, I guess I'm so stuck in the COVID and the vaccine and the testing and whatever, and, and I, I think about infectious disease, but there's so much more to public health that um, I'm not seeing, I guess, that I don't, I can't visualize. So I'm just curious about initiatives that you think might work for a regional approach? Yeah, I, I kind of, my knee jerk where I instantly go to is like food safety mm -hmm. with um, if other communities are following the FDA um, food safety program standards because mm -hmm. um, there's also additional grant funds that are available through that program mm -hmm. um, by the FDA. But I, I think that's just because of my own um, local health experience as well that mm -hmm. that was a, a deficit in my previous time mm -hmm. um i know uh pvt see when i think about shared agreements i know piner valley tobacco um commission mm -hmm. they're you know they do a, some education and and the shared inspections and regulation updates for us um and then i think some other communities have uh shared nurses agreements. I, I'm not sure if that would be very beneficial for Amherst right now, mm -hmm. um, but that's why I, I'm new in my role. So I'm really yeah, trying to, right. to think. lean on all of your expertise in terms of what's worked before yeah. or could be done. You know, my experience has been that the, the, the towns and the colleges work, work together a lot um, in certain situations. And, and that's the sense, my sense of the, when I've done anything that had a regional impact and it was often around um, outbreaks, you know, whether it was a meningitis case or cases or uh, whatever other kind of outbreak. Uh, but that's sort of a, a little bit of a narrow view, I guess. Um, also, you know, looking at what, what we can do for aging in place um, so that people aren't, people are moving to Hadley, people are, older people are moving out of here. If they don't move to, if they don't move to Amherst, uh, Applewood, they seem to go to the new housing in Hadley or um, that big, the Summerhill project, uh, which is very lovely in Belchertown. So we're getting, 
uh, and I don't know if we're meeting all the needs of, of people who are aging. That's where I started in 1985 when I moved to <laughs> well, the Council on Aging. <laughs> and I well, stayed with that until I got on the Board of Health. So I've gone from the Council on Aging to the Board of Health. And the, um, but not to lose that population. And once the 2020 um, census data comes out to look at our pockets. Um, I, I know when I looked at the Department of Education um, statistics, 48% two years ago of families in our grammar schools were on free or reduced um, lunches. So there's, there's, a, there's a poor population here that somehow mm -hmm. are we missing. It, you lose that when we get to the junior high and high school because we have Leverett, Pelham and Shutesbury come in. So there are more kids in the denominator that um, aren't uh, for the numerator of free lunches. So it goes down when you get into the, the middle and high school, but the grammar schools, it's been close to 50% on free and reduced um, lunch. So there's a, 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 a significant population of, of poor kids in town. In terms of the, um older residents, I've been involved in an organiz volunteer organization that is relatively new. It sort of was supposed to launch last March 29th. And we can tell you that didn't happen. And it's uh, called Amherst Neighbors. And the idea is to help uh, people age in place by providing uh, the social uh, contacts and uh, uh, events and um, neighborly services like uh, helping with grocery shopping or changing a light bulb or perhaps uh, taking the screens in and out and you know simple like things that aren't don't require any kind of licensing or anything else um, and it's just going to start getting off the ground now this year they've had a lot of online uh, programs and talks and discussions, but I, I think it's going to probably take off in this year. Um, and a lot of it is about fighting um, isolation and loneliness. And, you know, I think that is a big factor in, in that age group when people are housebound or limited in their ability to travel or get out of, get up, get around. So a lot of, I think in a lot of other, it's a, a nationwide, uh, part of a nationwide network called Village to Village. Um, and a lot of the services provided are rides, like rides to the doctor, but rides to your friend's house for a visit, rides to the, you know, it doesn't have to be like for, it's, it's the trying to work with the, um, the Council on Aging, you know, not to, not to overlap and not to butt heads. So, so it's, it's a little more open than the ride programs that are offered in, in other in other yeah. settings. So that's cool. something that's happening. Um, and Shrewsbury and Leverett have one, I think, and um, Northampton has a very act much more active group already. It's sort of like a local, no income eligibility volunteer Highland Valley Elder Services, because you have to be income eligible pretty much for most of Highland Valley. But it-, it Yeah, this is, and it's just, it's all volunteer. Mm -hmm. Some of these village to village programs charge a fee and actually they provide more services. They might have plumbers on their list or something, but um, this is basically no fee and um, all volunteer at this point. And, you know, and I think one of the, the things that's on the director, the board of directors minds is that reaching um, populations that are, are um, more diverse. I think that's that's a, 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 a an active thought, and how to do that is still unknown. But they're trying to work on some of that as they get going. So I've just been volunteered for them a little bit over the last couple of years, and hopefully that will <laughs> come to be. But um, you know that that's a whole population that we think about a lot. 
Nancy, I've got a seven o'clock commitment. I got okay. <laughs> Other comments? Then, if there are no further comments, can we have a move to and the meeting? I'll move the, John? I'll move, the, I'll move we adjourn. Second. Okay, all in favor? Steve? Aye. John? Aye. Maureen? Aye. Tim? Aye. Nancy? Aye. Thank you all. Mm. And I'll work Thank on you. that tobacco fact sheet. Okay. Thank you, Emma. For have a good week. Thank you, Emma. Yeah. Everything. <laughs> yeah. Work. And Thank you the, all. May the supply of doses hold. I got a second <laughs> dose appointment next Friday in Northampton. Is Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, that's what, what are the odds of it holding? It's pretty no. good for second <laughs> dose. Well, okay. that's when I was making those calls yesterday and there so many of the people had already gotten other appointments. I think they were expecting me to be disappointed. And um, I was like, that's so great. You already got vaccinated. <laughs> right. So right. thank you everybody for your support. Thank you. Yeah, take care. Take yeah. care. Have a, good, have a good month. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.